For hundreds of thousands of years, native people have lived on the North and South American continents. About 1,000 years ago, visitors began to arrive. In the year 1000, Leif Erikson boarded his Viking ship and sailed with the wind into a new world. He was among the first. Spain in 1492 sent Columbus in search of a better route to India. And landing on a new continent, he mistakenly called the people there Indians. And on the Pacific coast in 1741, Vitus Bering sailed from Russia to the newly discovered Alaskan coast. For these travelers, it was an exciting age of exploration, conquest, and trade. But for the one million American Indians who were already at home in the New World, it was an age of conflict and loss, the loss of lands they had occupied for thousands of years. Losing ground is the story of conflict over land. Conflicts between Indians and immigrants in North America and the 200 years we spent trying to resolve them. There were bloody battles, broken treaties, and pressure from land-hungry settlers that compelled the federal government to intervene with treaties, laws, and policies. For over 200 years, those federal Indian policies changed constantly, but always with the same consequences for American Indians, the loss of their tribal lands. It's important to understand the consequences of those early policies in the continental United States in order to understand what was to happen much later in Alaska. The same pressure from newcomers for land would lead Alaska natives to struggle for an entirely different policy the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act. But before we get to Alaska, let's start at the beginning. When the Europeans first arrived here, they felt they owned this land. After all, they just discovered it. They gave the rivers and the mountains new names. They drew maps on paper. They would buy and sell land to each other with written deeds of ownership. Indian tribes, on the other hand, had a different relationship with the land. We were like deer. They were like grizzly bears. We were content to let things remain as the great spirit chief made them. They were not and would change the rivers and the mountains if they did not suit them. Every year, more settlers arrived from the old world. The competition for Indian land became fierce. Some of the settlers just took whatever land they wanted. However, the Spanish, the English, and the Dutch had a curious notion that since the Indians were already here, they just might possibly have some rights to their own land and should be compensated for them. This uh, belief perhaps was reinforced by the fact that many Indian tribes were prepared to fight fiercely in defense of their land. So many of the settlers signed treaties of agreement or made payments for the land they wanted. The competition for land continued. Treaties were made, many were broken. Bitter fighting broke out, and there were terrible massacres on both sides. Homes and villages were burned, and many lives were lost. It was the responsibility of the United States government to deal with these conflicts over land. The Constitution was the first statement of federal Indian policy. It stated that Congress had the authority to negotiate with Indian tribes as separate nations. No one else had that authority, not the settlers and not the newly formed states. But as streams of settlers kept arriving, they required more and more land. The government of the United States was young. Its small army was far from the frontier, so it was difficult to control the movement of settlers or protect Indian lands from trespassers. When gold was discovered on Cherokee land in the state of Georgia, there was increased pressure to remove the Cherokee and let the miners move in. But the Cherokee refused to move. After all, they had adopted many of the settlers' ways, the English language, Christianity. For many years, they lived peacefully with their neighboring settlers. The Cherokee people 
believed their treaty with the federal government would protect their rights to the land. When the state of Georgia attempted to remove them, the tribe appealed to the federal Supreme Court to hear their case. In 1832, the Constitution was interpreted by the Supreme Court to mean that only the federal government could obtain title to Indian land. Therefore, the state of Georgia could not govern the Cherokee or transfer their land. But court decisions have little effect unless they're enforced. The invasion of Cherokee land by settlers and gold miners continued. In 1838, President Van Buren ordered federal troops to move 17,000 Cherokee in a 900-mile march in the midst of winter. 4,000 Cherokee died on the way. It became known as the Trail of Tears. Carrying only those belongings they had managed to save, the Cherokee people were moved west of the Mississippi River. Many other tribes had already been taken from their homelands. They were moved to a region which Congress in 1830 had declared Indian country when it adopted the Indian Removal Act. Neither the Constitution nor the Supreme Court policies had stopped the conflicts over land. And from 1830 to 1844, Congress's only solution was to pass the Indian Removal Act, separating Indians and settlers from each other. A pattern was beginning to emerge. Each time a federal Indian policy was established, the pressures from settlers hungry for land would change that policy to a new one. It was a pattern that would happen over and over again. President Andrew Jackson was a strong supporter of states' rights and the removal of Indian tribes to the West. Say to the chief and warriors that I wish to act as their friend, but they must settle on the lands I offer them, which they shall possess as long as the grass shall grow or the water run. Settlers kept pouring into every section of the country. Gold miners, homesteaders, land speculators. The Transcontinental Railroad was consuming huge tracts of lands as it crossed the country. The end of the open range forever. Indian lands and people were being surrounded. Many tribes were already islands in the midst of an unending stream of settlers and fortune seekers. There was nowhere else for them to be moved. Indian leaders went to Washington for help in protecting their land. But because they were not allowed to vote, they had little political power. Between 1820 and 1844, the Indian removal policy caused over three-fourths of the Indian population living east of the Mississippi River to be moved west. And in spite of Andrew Jackson's promise that tribes would possess their new lands forever, many would have to move again. Even in Indian country, tribal lands were not protected. The policy of Indian removal was replaced in 1850 by a new one, reservations. As tribal lands were divided into specific reservations, excess lands were sold to land speculators. Families were no longer self-sufficient. They had to depend on food rations since they could no longer leave the reservation to hunt or gather food. Government supplies, schools, churches, and health clinics arrived on reservations, along with poverty, disease, and unemployment. I was born upon the prairie, where the wind blew free, and where there were no enclosures, and where everything drew a free breath. I want to die there, and not within walls. As reservations were formed, Indian lands were decreasing in every region of the country. Tribes were no longer free to travel or hunt over their traditional lands. Many social reformers and members of Congress were convinced that reservations weren't working. So in 1887, federal Indian policy changed again to the General Allotment Act. 
The idea was to introduce Indian tribes to farming and divide reservations into small plots, individually owned. Surplus land was sold to outsiders. Because the land allotments were small, with no credit to farmers to buy more land, better seeds, or plows, most attempts at farming didn't work. Many Indians ended up selling their individual allotments to non-Indians. By 1900, 13 years after the Allotment Act, the amount of land owned by Indian tribes, 156 million acres, was reduced by almost half to 78 million. But land was not the only loss experienced by Indian tribes. When the first explorers arrived in the New World, there were an estimated one million American Indians. By 1890, two-thirds of them had perished. The Allotment Act had succeeded in dividing up many reservations, but it failed to turn Indian tribes into farmers. By 1934, there was a significant shift in federal policy to the Indian Reorganization Act, or the IRA. John Collier, the new Indian commissioner, believed in strengthening Indian communities, not dissolving them. Under the Indian Reorganization Act, tribes were encouraged to reestablish traditional leadership on reservations and exercise more control over their own lives and their own land. During the Allotment Act, many reservations had been divided into farms, and tribal land had decreased by an estimated 78 million acres. But during the Indian Reorganization Act, four million acres of tribal land were restored. This time, federal Indian policy meant the return of Indian lands. World War II began, and 25,000 Indians signed up for the armed forces. 40,000 workers left the reservations for wartime jobs in the cities. Those who wanted to return at the end of the war did not find the reservations prosperous. There were few jobs or businesses there. Even with government aid, there was widespread poverty. Just 15 years after the IRA had tried to strengthen reservation life, there was another shift in policy to the termination of reservations. The federal government would no longer be responsible for the health and welfare of Indian people. This long-standing federal support had always been opposed by those politicians who felt that it somehow was not in the American tradition of self-reliance. Even those in Congress who supported Indian rights were often in favor of getting rid of reservations. They saw them as rural ghettos of poverty and segregation and wanted to see them ended. Indian people would be removed from their land and assimilated with the rest of the American people. But it was on reservations that Indian people still had land and a tribal identity. Off the reservations, they had neither. During the termination of over 14 reservations, tribal lands decreased again, this time by one and a half million acres. Termination would not be the last federal Indian policy or the end of Indian people as a distinct group of Americans. The movement in Congress to terminate the federal government's special relationship with Native Americans actually led many tribes to organize and protest the loss of their land and tribal status. Through all the years of policies, only two things remained constant. The amount of Indian land was decreasing, and the tribal way of life was changing. After almost 200 years of federal Indian policy in the continental United States, attention would shift to Alaska. How had these policies set the stage for a new Indian land policy? the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act. 
Congress would have to write a new chapter of Indian land policy in Alaska, what would it look like this time?